describe some work <coughs> which I completed around uh, two weeks ago, which appeared here. In fact, it's, I, was, I never expected to post preference for StatMec the statistical physics, so it was, it was a surprise for me. So, <coughs> the main goal of this talk was the following question, namely how to compute the entropy of a set of relatively high dimensional binary configurations. So, <coughs> here the key examples which would be relevant would be the following. So, first of all, we take Monte Carlo simulations of some physical spin system at a given temperature. And the question is, can we take just those configurations at a single temperature and compute entropy? And in this case, of course, we could also estimate the free energy directly from those configurations. The second, and here, in this context, especially this high dimensionality is an important uh, assumption. Because if the system is, has small dimensions, then basically one can compute the entropy in very many ways, and there's no problem whatsoever. However, if we have a system of high, with high dimensionality, as I will explain later, we have some problems. But there are also other applications, for example, in information content of a set of spiking neurons. So very often in neuroscience, people just measure a time series of neurons, which are related to high dimensionality, and want, people want to estimate what is the information content. So they want to have take those signals, binary signals, and compute the channel entropy of those signals. And also, and basically, any other high dimensional binary signal would be applicable. And in fact, the motivation for this work was a project that we had with Shannon Vitasche on complexity for deep neural networks. And then we wanted to have some method for computing entropy. And this was basically the reason why how this work came about. So the plan of this talk is as follows. First, I will describe Shannon entropy and its conventional estimation. Then I move on to discuss entropy in physics and what are the <coughs> differences here, and what are the main methods of computing entropy uh, when this is for physics. Then I will give a very brief introduction to machine learning. So what is machine learning? And then present the method of computing entropy using those tools. And I will give some results for some two data sets. One is the synthetic data set, and another is the case of two-dimensional Ising model, which is nice because then we can com compare with exact known formulas. And with some other questions. OK, so what is the conventional way to compute channel and talk? So first of all, we, have, we are dealing with some n-dimensional binary signal. So we have like n, vari n binary variables, which come from some probability distribution. And then the channel on top is, of course, defined by the following formula. Here, I use base two logarithms, so I will always measure entropy in base. But of course, it's completely essential. And here, the main problem to use this formula is to estimate the probability distribution, because usually we don't have it given as a formula which we could just use, or it's too complicated to use. So we want to estimate this probability distribution from data. So the standard simplest way, of course, is if we have a set of n samples, then just count the number of occurrences, k, when a given configuration appears. And then make a histogram, and for each configuration we have a number of occurrences, and then we can estimate the probability of this configuration to be k divided by the total number of samples. And now if we plug this back in to this formula, this gives something which is called a plug-in, or maximum likelihood estimate of the data. Now, it turns out, so this is what I knew before I started looking at this problem. Then it turns out that, in fact, this is a biased estimate, and there are lots of modified versions, which somehow aim to, uh, because this estimate is somehow under, um, underestimates the value of the entropy. So, for example, Miller and Maddow gave a prescription that one should take the previous computation and add to it the number of distinct configurations minus one divided by the total number of samples. Then some Bayesian modeling. Instead of k over n, <coughs> we kind of smooth it with some parameter a, which depends on various kind of assumed uh, trial distributions. And there are lots of other variations which somehow aim to improve this estimator in some way. And even some much more complicated uh, estimated like NSB and CDM, which seems to be the state of the outcome, yeah, would somehow 
fit a mixture of Dirichlet distributions and then try to um, estimate enthalpy. But all those estimators basically start from the currents, from current currents. Okay, and now we have some problems. So clearly, if we increase the dimensionality, the number of possible configurations just increases to the, to the n. Therefore, very soon, we will reach a situation where each configuration just occurs at most once in our sample of data. And in fact, this is a very generic situation like in physics simulations, like in Monte Carlo simulations. Because, for example, if we just take a two-dimensional Heising model on a just 20 by 20 lattice, then it has 10 to the 120 possible configurations. And therefore, if we have a small set of a few thousand, 10,000, 20,000 samples, then basically each configuration just appears only once. So if we cannot use at all the previous ways of evaluating entropy based on occurrence counts, because each configuration appears only once, we have 20,000 samples, and this formula does not give us any information as well as any of this, its further refinements. So we cannot use all those <coughs> this technology, unfortunately. Now, um, there's another method which seems to be nice and very promising, which is, and this is an exact formula, so one can expand the entropy as a sum of the entropies of the individual spins, and then subtract of a collection coming from mutual information between pairs of spins, and then add like triple mutual information and higher ones. So this formula, as it stands, is exact. So if we would be able to compute each of those terms individually, then we would be fine. However, the problem is that, <coughs> first of all, we see that here we have like 400, for the easing model, 400 squared terms, here we have 400 cube terms. So the complexity increases very much. And if we just truncate it at the first two terms, then if we apply it for the Ising model, then close to the phase transition, we'll get negative entropy estimates. Namely, this contribution is so big that it's bigger than the leading one. So therefore, this shows that all those higher terms are important, and we should be able to compute them, but they are too difficult to compute. So unfortunately, this really does not, does not work. So we cannot use this method. Now, in physics, <coughs> we do not have this type of complete generality, the nearest of the probability distribution as I described earlier, but we know that the probability distribution has a form of a Boltzmann distribution, where this energy here is typically, first of all, known, and also it's easy to evaluate. So this is a nice feature of physics, physical complex. However, this does not help us to compute the entropy, because if we take the log of t, then this part will be easy, but we'll get also log of z, which is a partition function. And of course, in log of z, we have to have sum over all configurations. And therefore, for the easy model, we have to sum for 10 to 120 configurations in principle, or somehow estimated in, in, in a reliable way. And this is extremely difficult, and not impossible to evaluate. So in, in this context, basically, computing entropy is equally difficult as computing the partition function or the free energy because, of course, this expectation value of the energy is very easy to compute from Monte Carlo. So, but of course, these quantities are very important, so this is developed in various indirect methods to compute the entropy. And basically, I have the two methods. First is like temperature integration. So it consists, it um, amounts to the following. So first we want to compute the heat capacity of the system at a given temperature, and this can be estimated from the variance of the energy. So this is something which is simple to compute from a set of Monte Carlo configurations at a given temperature. And then it turns out that one can evaluate the entropy as an integral over the temperature of the C of T divided by T. So this is nice, but in order to, to use this formula, if we are interested at the entropy at some temperature t naught, we need to perform Monte Carlo simulations from zero temperature up to this temperature. Also, it's sufficiently like a <coughs> dense range so that we could estimate numerically this integral, numerical integral 
uh, to take a degree if you want to estimate that. So this is really quite quite complicated. Then there's another way, which was so-called land, Landau sampling. Well, here Landau is not the land, Lev Landau, but it's another Landau, because this paper came from 2001, which in fact does not use the original Monte Carlo configurations at all, but proposes to, to use some completely different kind of Monte Carlo sampling to evaluate the density of states. So this is nice, but here we don't use configurations at all, but we have to perform completely different numerical computations to obtain the density of states, and then we can compute them. Okay, so the goal of this work was to try to find a method for computing the entropy just directly from binary configurations, which would work exactly in this regime where each configuration appears only once, or does not appear at all. So, and then we'd like to apply it to compute the entropy and free energy directly from these Monte Carlo configurations at a given temperature. So for example, for the Ising model, here are some Monte Carlo configurations at TC. So we have like 10 configurations. Of course, we would like to have 20,000 configurations and from them to compute the entropy and the free energy. Okay, so what is the what, 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 what idea, what approach one could try to use? So let us go back to this previous formula. So if we look at the entropy, just from the point of view of counting configurations, basically what we do is we treat each configuration as a kind of structureless atomic object. Right? It's some, we just forget about how it's made of spins, it's the other and irregularities between the spins, we just say that this is a distinct configuration. And we forget all the internal details. And we only count the occurrences. So in this way we kind of throw away a lot of information which is still present in, in our system. So the idea to kind of work with this opposite regime where like, k is always 1 is to somehow analyze the internal structure of those configurations and in this way kind of to sidestep the problem of, of, uh, of the fact that we cannot really use such a problem. So this is basically the main kind of idea. But of course we have to somehow have some way of approaching this internal structure and what we what I propose here is to use machine learning methods. So now I'll just go a very fast introduction to machine learning. So what is machine learning? What does it, uh, what does it mean? Okay, so what is machine learning? So machine learning, from simplified very much, basically is a set of algorithms which, for which we give some set of example data points belonging to various classes. So like images and then cats, dogs, trains, buses, and so on. Then, this algorithm learns just based on looking at those examples. So it's not kind of a flowchart that we look at edges, we see, we see a circle, then we say that it's a car, and so on. But we just show examples, we don't give any kind of external prior knowledge, and somehow the algorithm should somehow learn by looking at the data, in such a way that then, when we put, give to provide to it new unseen data, it can classify those points to, to the classes which we have. So that's how, how it works. And <coughs> of course machine learning is quite an old domain, but we recently we had like a complete renaissance of machine learning which came from uh, sets of deep neural networks on, on some image data sets. For example, first it was a list, which are just handed in digits, then Cypher, which are like 10 classes, 32 by 32 images. But the whole kind of hype went up when uh, those deep neural networks got very good results on ImageNet, which is a million images of in 1,000 classes. So really they could distinguish a lot of those, those images with very, with very good, good accuracy. And then, of course, there was a boom in, in, in machine learning. So, of course, there's a wide variety of, of those algorithms, and deep neural networks are the most well known. How, however, there are lots of other algorithms which are, in fact, quite very useful and sometimes maybe more useful if we don't have that many, much, many data as deep neural networks usually need. So, apart from deep neural networks, we have also random forests, something which is called gradient boosted trees, 
nearest neighbors, and logistic regression, and many, many more. So now, um, consider now a two class problem. So suppose that we have an image showing cats and dogs. So we have just a binary class. So y equal to 1 is a cat, and y equal to 0 is a dog. It turns out that if we look closely into those algorithms, they do not just give for us a classification that this image is an image of a cat, but what they really give us is they give us a probability that a given image has class 1. So a probability that a given image is a dog or a cat. So what this means mathematically is that basically what those machine learning algorithms give for us is they give for us a conditional probability distribution that y is equal to 1, so it is a class of the image, based conditioned on all the data which we give. So for example, here we have all pixels of the image. And as you can imagine, this is a very complex function if we have pixels of the image and we have, want to extract just a cat or a dog, probability to a cat or a dog. So this is the reason why these machine learning uh, tools can be very useful for computing the entropy, because basically what we see that those machine learning tools really are designed to model extremely complex conditional probability distributions and more than those prob conditional probability distributions just by looking at data. So this is the main kind of conceptual reason why it's mm, useful. And we will encounter exactly this conditional probability distribution when we look at the formula for computing the answer. So let me now give two examples. So in my talk later I will describe what I will use most of gradient boosted trees and logistic regression. So just to, for you to see how this works in practice. First, I will just say a few words about logistic regression. So this is the absolutely baseline, simplest possible classifier, which is basically just a linear model. So the model for this conditional distribution, probability distribution, is as follows. It's given just by sigmoid, so this function, of a linear function. So basically, when, this, when the argument here is minus infinity, it's zero, probability is zero. When this is plus infinity, the probability is one. And what this model learns, in training, it learns the parameters w, i, and b, so the weights and so-called bias. So we just show many examples. It learns those parameters in such a way that something which is called cross entropy loss is minimized. So this is the formula which is minimized. So for minimization of this formula and showing data, we extract with w, i, and b. So just to show how this works, suppose that one example the label is 1. So then, of course, the second term vanishes. And what remains here is we have to look at the logarithm of the probability. So if the algorithm is, nine, is good and estimates the probability is 1, then this loss vanishes and we are perfect. If it makes a mistake and says that the probability is 0, then this will be infinite. So therefore, in this way, the network also, or the model somehow learns to get good um, estimates for the probability that a given sample belongs to some class. And it learns not to be very confident like in giving bad results. Because the error, if it makes a huge error and just puts here, yeah, if we have an example of class 1 and says it, says it, it's, if it says the probability is 0, then we get infinite error. So somehow it's a kind of conservative way of estimating probabilities. And in, in fact, despite its simplicity, this logistic regression works quite well. So if there are very noisy data with lots of additional noise, then this is really a good model, much better than one would expect from just a linear model. Now the second um, model which I will, I will use in the, in the examples is something which is called gradient boosted tree classifier. So this is more complex. It can really learn a full, fully nonlinear decision boundary probability function. And basically, the idea is as follows that somehow it constructs like a lot, 100 or 200 decision trees of various depths, and then tries to combine those outputs and give an estimate. So here's an example from some documentation page. And here the idea is we ask what is the probability that a person will like a computer game. 
So the first three tells us that if, if he, the age is less than 20, then he should like it because we get plus two. If he's older, he shouldn't, he wouldn't like it. It's minus one. Then another three would be use computer data. If we use computer data, then perhaps we have more chance of liking the computer game. If we don't use computers, we should be penalized. And then if we show an example, for example, for this for a boy, he is less than 20 years old, so he gets two from the first three. He uses computer daily, he gets plus 0 0.9, so it's 2.9, and then we could, could fit this into the sigma, sigmoid and get a probability. And here, for grandfather, it's very bad, right? Right for the girl, she's young, but she doesn't use, use computer daily, so it's an intermediate. So of course, this is just depth one. Typically, those trees are, have higher depths, like three, five, and so on. And of course, one has to pick what features to use here, what threshold levels to choose, and so on. So it's quite complex, but the ready-made algorithms would just construct those trees. And <coughs> this is also trying to minimize the cost of loss. In fact, it works surprisingly well. So this is a specific algorithm which is called XGBoost, which is runs Excel Multico on, on GPUs, which is very, 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 has very good performance on various, various things. So we will be using this uh, uh, example here. OK, so now let us <coughs> return to, to the end token. So how to look on this? So here the idea is to start from a very simple formula from probability theory. Namely, that if we have any n dimensional probability distribution, whether binary or continuous, whatever, then it can be factored into just a one point probability distribution times a conditional probability distribution of x2 given x1, then conditional of x3 given x1 and x2, and so on. And this is just an exact rewriting of the formula for the probability. And now the idea is to take this formula. In Shannon's entropy, we have log p. So just plug it into log p. And then clearly, the entropy will decompose into some n terms. So we can now look how those terms will look, will look like. So the first term is very simple. This is just the entropy of the first neuron of first spin. This is basically what comes out. What's more interesting is the second term. It's following ones. We have the same structure. So I'll just describe the second term in more detail. So if we just write it, so the second term is given by summation of configurations. Here we have probability distribution of just x1 and x2, because all the rest are just integrated out to 1, times log of this conditional probability distribution. So let us look uh, what, it, what this looks like. Now, since here we have a summation of the over p of x1 and x2, it's very easy to estimate it if we have samples. So basically what we just do, if we have our samples, we just sum over samples, just the log. And now we look that this x2, k okay, is a spin, so it's a binary variable by, by assumption. Right, so it's like a class. So then, we can just write this sum summation in the following form. So this is just an exact rewriting taken into account that x2 can be either 1 or 0, and then probability when it's 0 is just 1 minus p2. And now you see that this is exactly the cross entropy loss of some classification problem where we try to predict the class of the value of spin x2 based on the value of x1. So what enters here is exactly p of x2 equals 1, condition of x1, which is just the simplest example of, of this classification problem, classification problems which I mentioned before. And the contribution to the entropy is just the cross-entropy cross loss of this, of this um, um, classifier. Class so the prescription for computing the entropy is as follows. So the 
estimate of the entropy is given by a sum of those n terms, where each term is a cos entropy loss of a supervised classification problem where we try to predict the probability of xj equal to 1 based on j minus 1 previous spins. And we just do it iteratively. So then, and, and so on. And what is nice what in this reformulation is basically that we can use absolutely any machine learning classification algorithm to do, to do that. So therefore we have a choice of depending on the structure of the data, if we have lots of examples, high dimensionality and so on, we can pick which machine learning algorithm to use. And then, then just use those cross entropy losses. This has been something you can weigh on the permutation of the circuit? It should be. So well, uh, but it's a very good point. So I, I will I was in, in two slides I will just exactly address this observation. So first <coughs> so one perhaps difference in with con conventional machine learning is that usually when we have those machine learning problems like images of cats and dogs, usually they have a definite answer. So if we have an image we know that there's a cat inside or it's a dog. Here, so therefore we would say that an ideal classifier would always have cross entropy loss zero because it would just identify a dust or a tree or a cat or a dog. Now here it's not so because suppose that here you can have a situation that the spin xj is just completely independent from the previous spins. It may happen to be like that. And then the classifier can only predict its probability. But for irrespective of those values. So then the constant of the loss so the contribution of the spin, spin xj, xj will be just its entropy. So basically those cross entropy losses just give a contribution of if we add an additional spin to the system, how much the total entropy will increase. So this is a situation where it will increase in the maximum way. On the other hand, if the spin would be completely determined by the previous ones, so it would be evaluated with 100 degree precision, then of course the classifier, ideal classifier would be vanishing cross entropy loss and they would be, it would not give a shift of the entropy. So this is the way that this estimate is built. We start from a spin and then we add like what we can predict, right, is something which is simple and we see what is the remaining variation. So this is what the cross entropy losses give for us. So it means that, sorry, but it means that those higher times are less and less significant for very large time. It can happen. It can happen, but, but not necessarily. Not, not, not necessary. Because, well, at the end you can have also some, a couple of spins which are completely independent from the previous ones, but then they would give just... But for highly structured data, we would expect, perhaps. Yes, yeah, so if there are a lot of correlations, yes. then indeed, yes. I'm just curious for a very large end, right? Because that was the problem before, for huge yeah. dimensions. Yes, but depending on like, yeah, the yeah. interdependence, structure, various situations may, may occur. <coughs> now we know, so coming back to your, what you asked, of course those specific classification problems, they depend on the ordering, because we, to have this decomposition, we have to fix the ordering from the start. So the final, but the final answer for some of constant process has to be the same, right? because it says the entropy. But the classification problems in between are completely different because we classify completely different spins as a function of other spins. So therefore, it will, it will be a non-trivial consistency check of this procedure to evaluate the same computation for various orderings because then we can see to what extent this classifier is good enough in a sense. Right? Also, this will give us what is the at least the smallest error possible in this computation. So therefore, it's always it's nice to check those orderings. Now, another issue, which is important, is that in machine learning, one should never evaluate machine learning models on the data which were used for training. The reason is that then we could, our estimates of probabilities will be completely off. For example, if it would have a stupid classifier, which just remembers all the data which we showed to it, right, and then we show again those same data points, then it would trade out probably to one, which is completely nonsense. So therefore, we have to take care of that. And then the standard way to sidestep this issue is to use something which is called k-fold 
convalidation. So what is, what is this? So suppose that K is five. So what we partition our data set into five parts. And then we use four parts for training. We train the classifier. And then we predict probabilities on, on this remaining part. And then we train on these guys and predict here, and so on. And then for the predictions, which would enter the cross interpolosis, losses, we only take those out of sample predictions which we obtained here. So in this way, you can be sure that at least uh, somehow it's more or less reliable. And also, since we have many classification problems, it's good to shuffle the data so that those splits are different for each of those many classification problems. So therefore, it will not be biased by some bad choice in the beginning. OK, the final question which you can ask is, I thought told that we, have, we can use any classifier. So suppose that we use two, and we get different answers. So which answer to choose? Now it turns out that in the limit of infinite data, this entropy from this machine learning classifier estimates the true entropy from above. And the argument is very simple. So suppose we have to take just the difference of those terms. This is the true delta S2, where we use the exact probability, conditional probability distribution, which we don't know. And this is the one which we use from the classifier. So then, this should be less than, than zero for this uh, conclusion to hold. So by yes, it's equality, inequality, we can just pull the log the difference is given by this formula. By yes, the inequality, we can just put log outside here. And now this ratio will be just P of X1. And it turns out very simple computation shows that this, the right hand side here, is just exactly equal to zero. So therefore, we always will estimate the topic from above. So therefore, if we have two different answers, and we have lots of data, we should just pick the lower one because this is estimates better the total entropy. So this is the <coughs> OK, so now I will to describe two examples. So the first example is a kind of synthet synthetic data set with lots of functional dependence between them. And then we will describe the case of two-dimensional Ising model in Monte Carlo with the configurations. So first, this synthetic data set. So suppose that we have x1 will be 50 independent binary variables with probability 1 half. x2 will be again another 50 independent variables. And for x3, we will take functions of those previous data sets. So for example, x3 could be not x1. Or it could be x1 or x2, x1 and x2, and x1, so x2, x plus x1. And then we just concatenate x1, x2, and x3 for each of those variants. So in this way, we get 150 binary variables which we shuffle. And we just take 10,000 samples from these, from these distributions. Now, the nice feature here is that all those data sets have an entropy of 100 bits, because of course x2 is completely <coughs> determined in terms of x1 and x2. So these are just some additional variables. So now we can try to see how our method, how it can, whether it can extract those dependence, interdependence structure. So we will we use here exactly those two classifiers, logistic regression and gradient boosted trees. And here's the answer. So, we should get 100. So we see that from logistic regression we get 100, 101. From gradient boost we have also 100, like this. But for XOR, X plus XOR, which is unsurprising, that's why I chose it, of course, is that this interdependent structure of this XOR data set cannot be captured by a linear model. And we see that logistic regression just overshoots and gives 150. Right? So it doesn't really see this interdependence. However, boosted trees, the non linear classifier, does better. But if we increase the number of trees from 100 to 200 to 100, we get better and better description of the data. So we approach the <coughs> If I would put here 800, 1000, or 800, it will be very close to, to the exact answer. 
So in this way, so first of all, this is to show that sometimes non-reality is really important. But secondly, it also tells us that if we compare our estimates of entropy coming from different classifiers, we can get some interesting insight into the data. For example, by looking at the difference between those two, we can see that we can access somehow the complexity of inherent <coughs> linear interdependence of these data points. That this is a much more complicated and non-trivial data set than these ones. So this is one way of using such an analysis. Another way is that sometimes, on the other hand here, you can just see that with this a simpler and faster model can be much more efficient and get <coughs> um, a good estimate of it. Okay. So that was the synthetic data set, but the key example which what was the most interesting for me as a, as a cross check was to use um, the two dimensional Ising model and try to estimate a varied entropy and free energy from Monte Carlo configurations of this of the system, taking the temperature. So we generated 20,000 configurations of this model on a 20 by 20 periodic lattice. And we have a range of temperatures from 1 to 4. And the critical temperature was 2.2. So it goes in both phases and also close to the critical uh, assumption in between. And as, as I said before, there are lots of configurations, 10 to 120. And in fact, for temperatures greater than 2.7, in those genetic samples, we checked that, I checked that there are only distinct configurations. So we cannot use any kind of based estimates. And what's nice about the model is, of course, that apart from the on solution, there is also a refinement by Kaufmann, which gives an exact solution for finite L by L lattice. So one can be really extremely precise, and everything is just analytic. So using Mathematica, one can get exact predictions for this particular lattice size. And also, since we want this method to be very general, so not to really use any kind of spatial structure, therefore we just put a random ordering of the spins. So we do not keep this ordering in rows and, and columns, but just complete random permutation of all the variables. So in order for the machine learning algorithm to retreat by itself, kind of reconstruct all this um, dependence. <coughs> okay, so first, before in the synthetic data set, I showed that sometimes one has to increase the number of trees, right? Because the data, the data set can be too, co can be, um, too complex. So here I'm going to look at those hyperparameters FG boost algorithm. So there are basically two simplest ones. So first is the depth of the tree, so how many branches we each tree will have, and then the number number of trees which we, which this algorithm constructs. And here we have an answer. The exact answer is 0 0.42468. And basically what we see is that if we have two small number of trees, we kind of have two large estimates of the entropy, therefore this model is too simple. On the other hand, if we increase the number of trees, somehow we can also get those results. So this comes from overfitting, in the sense that the classifier sees some noise in the data and thinks that it's a genuine property and then tries to use it, but of course on cross-validation this will cause, this will cause the entropy to rise. So therefore we see that basically here we get the best result of 50, and uh, where the default one is handled. So if we just run the default one, we also get quite a good result. So it's not really... Here we know the right answer. Here we know the right answer, but... <coughs> what is this time? Is this time in seconds or...? Time in minutes. In minutes, okay. So, it's time in minutes on a desktop. So, not on okay. laptop, but on six core desktop, and the uh, XG boost can use all cores. It can also use GPU. So, uh, so it's quite. Right. So, if you wouldn't know the right answer, you would just take the smallest number. I would take the smallest number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, here, the smallest, the smallest number. <coughs> then, also, one can ask what is the dependent on the number of samples. And here, it's quite natural. What we expect indeed happens is that if we increase the number of samples, then the estimate goes down. So it becomes closer and closer, better and better, which is very natural right? because the more data we put, you will have all those machine learning classifiers that are much, much, much better. But of course, the drawback is that random time increases. So 
Oh, each data set one has to somehow make a compromise between the two. What is quite amusing is that here I use a linear extrapolation in one over n, which gets then but it is quite a good result. And also looking at those points, indeed they seem to rely on the line. How do we don't have any theoretical uh, reasons to expect this type of scaling goods end? So it's kind of Mr. In a sense, an open question, what should be the correct scaling or whether this is generic or um, Okay, but in any case, in all subsequent computations, I just use 20,000 samples. So that's the <coughs> original one. So this is about the entropic spin which, which we get. So the black line, so which links those points, is the exact value from 20 by 20 is anything more than. The red points are those ones which are obtained from this XG boost, then equals 50 degrees. Here we see that this, this deviation at the smallest, lowest temperature. But it's also a magenta point here, which, is, which I will comment on that on the, in two slides. So we see that we have a very good agreement with, with the exact result. And also we can just extract the free energy per spin and also get a nice result also with some small deviation at the lowest temperature. So let me just comment now on this point, what happens, what happens here. So in this phase, so this is quite low temperature, so the exit model here is in the ordered phase. So the ordered phase means that all spins are predominantly just in one direction. Now from the point of view of a machine learning classification problem, this means that the classes are just almost always one, sometimes this is zero, somewhere, right? So therefore, this is something which is called an unbalanced problem in machine learning, and basically it's quite difficult. So usually those machine learning algorithms have to struggle because one can be very lazy and just predict always one, right? And get good accuracy. So therefore, and, all, and here, since here we have to estimate the probability that it's not one, therefore it's quite subtle to get this number, number right. So we need more data. So one possibility would be just to generate more Monte Carlo data. However, since this problem of running out of data is very common also in machine learning, one can use a technique called data augmentation. So this a technique which is used usually for those image data sets, which basically means that if we have some photos, we can just take, take some random crops or we can do some reflections. So in this way, from a limited number of data points, we can generate many more samples. So here we can do the same. So we just take our original 20,000 Monte Carlo configurations, but for example, just use rotations by 90 degrees. So from this original configuration, I can just take, generate four more data points. And now from the point of view of those auxiliary classification problems, this would be completely novel data. Because for example, if we want to predict this spin as a function of these three ones, then we see that those data points will be completely, completely different. But independent, independent. So in this way, we can very easily generate additional data and get the results. So what we did that, so using those 80,000 data points, we got those, those uh, magenta points on the plot, and they really fitted much better uh, the results at t equal to one. So can you think of this as a particular piece of permutation that you mentioned before? <coughs> yes, yeah, so this is a pixel permutation, but here of course we have to have a system which has symmetries. Right? Because we have to know that the new configurations have to come from the same oh, yes, dis dis distribution. So for example, for, for this Isaac model, we could Apart from that, we could also take arbitrary periodic translations and also mirror reflections. But if we would have like a disordered system, then of course we would have to generate new data. We would not be able to do any, um, any additional uh, manipulations. So, and also like for, in, for the case of spiking neurons, then of course we would have to generate new data because we expect those neurons to be completely different, like represent different, different roles. 
So depending, so in some cases one can very easily generate lots of additional data, but in some other cases we have just to get real data. <coughs> okay, so now um, can we conclude? So basically what so called a very general method which translates the problem of computing the entropy into so binary configurations into into a sequence of supervised classification tasks. And the main point like, of application is that this work, this method, look, by looking at the structure, internal structure of those configurations, it works also in the regime where all configurations appearing in the sample are quite distinct, and this is especially more relevant for Monte Carlo simulations in physics. So at least to my knowledge, it was basically so it is quite virtually impossible to get entropy and free energy from Monte Carlo configurations at a fixed temperature, if you call something because of that. But here, by looking, exploiting the fact that those machine learning algorithms can model extremely complex conditional probability distributions, one can somehow overcome this, pro this, uh, this problem. And the fact that they can learn directly from, from data. So we verified that this method works for the 2D easy model. And as I said, we can use virtually any machine learning classification algorithm. So on the one hand, we can compare different answers and get some more insight into the data to what, how complex are the data because even with the same entropy we can have simple data or complex data so this is quite interesting possible applications application secondly for example one could use some Bayesian classifiers in the case where we have like large dimensionality and not many data samples so one can perhaps develop or optimize which algorithms to use in what cases were based on the specificity or dimensionality of, of the data that we are interested to, to study. And also, finally, the applicability is not restricted to physics, because here we don't really need, need the system to be described by a Hamiltonian or to have any kind of notion of Monte Carlo. What enters the problem, what enters the algorithm is just binary configurations as they exist. So they can be completely physics unrelated, like those spiking neurons or whatever. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? There's another the, the remark that the IC model is an example of Markov of Gibbs field. For which we have Hammers Lake, P4 Kiosk, which says that the, the commission distribution for given vertex is, is completely determined by, by, only by, by, by the neighbors, making this problem much simpler. So we can, we, we can just take, take a vertex and neighbors. Takes probably distribution and determine the, 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 the exploration. So, so I think simpler, simpler methods can be used here. It's, but we can discuss it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you use for not binary problems? Free yes. states or, or it becomes yes. no, much well, more, no, more no. complicated? So, so for this grid, it should, one could generalize it the straightforward way and get multi class classification problem. So like for, for exactly for three state post model, one would have zero, one, two. So it corresponds to three classes. Okay. And also one would minimize the cost and top. Yeah. Just 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 one more question. Just technically you you you, you compute all these cross entropy terms or you just cut at some uh, I compute all. All of them. Yes. So so for the any model one has to have four hundred. Yeah, four hundred different yeah, terms. Um, different terms and each term is computed by cost validation. So it's five. So uh, it, 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 it all just takes like this twenty whatever minutes. Yes, which yes. Is so, 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 so total running time okay. in this case. And this this cross entropy is just the number you get from your uh, from your uh, I mean it, it it's just the number you 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 get from this machine learning algorithm. Yes. Okay? Yes. yes. If you make the lattice bigger, let's say thirty or forty how it would scale. Well, this case, so here, the number of problems with scale is linear, the number of signs scale with n, which is nice. Mm -hmm. What may be a bit more complicated, depending on the algorithm, we we'll know have to know how the algorithm scales with the number of features. Mm -hmm. But in fact here, I guess it's not so fast. Uh, like the scaling is not, not so bad. So I couldn't wait because I, the program just gave a printout after each, each screen. 
so it didn't kind of slow down dramatically, right? so I didn't see the by, by eye. But I, I didn't try to. No, it's, it's quite impressive that you got this from 20,000 configuration. Yeah, from put on number 10 to 120. Yeah, 120, and so it's a remarkable reduction. 10 to 116 of this. <coughs> Have any problems in the statistic of physics in mind to which this method can be applied? Well, I hope that since like Monte Carlo simulations are extremely useful and used, then this can be applied to any such situation. But not, uh, I didn't, I didn't think of any concrete problem, but just as a gen general method. So I think that it has extremely wide range of applicability. But, um, I guess Monte Carlo are used very often, and also entropy free energy is an important quantity to compute. So here we can side step to Nang Bank, Hamdo Bank, sampling of this temperature integration, and we'll just extract entropy directly from configurations which are used for correlation functions. Z, so you can create anything. Yes. But say for specific heat fluctuations, you probably kill correct. Yeah. 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 Y